Hey, Bob W. Pierre, and welcome to Do the Boo, the WooCommerce Builder Podcast. This show is brought to you by MindSize, making your life easier as their team will take care of a lot of the after-project worries for your client's sites with solid maintenance and optimization services. And Capture 4WP plugin from WP White Security that lets you easily integrate Google Captcha on your clients' Woo shops. I'll tell you more about our pod friends later in the show, but let's segue into another dev chat with our hosts, Zach, Carl, and Till. Till joins us later in the show, but of course, as with any dev chat, it's a lively conversation. This time, it's all about the evolution of WooCommerce hosting, although the bigger hosting picture is talked about as well. The three of them have all worked a lot with hosting companies one way or another, and they bring in some great insights into the space. And later in the show, they also bring in the needs for a marketplace or their thoughts around a marketplace. So let's get into it without any further delay. Welcome to another episode of the Woo Dev Chats. I'm Zach Stepik here with Carl Alexander today. Hello. How are you doing, Carl? I'm doing good. How about yourself? I'm doing really well. Um, we're missing Till today. Uh, he injured his knee a week ago. That's not fun. But he is hopefully doing better. Uh, he said it's mostly healed now, which is nice. So he's taking it easy as one should. Yeah, he absolutely should take it easy. Um so today we've decided that we're going to talk about the evolution of hosting and what, yeah. what does that mean? Yeah, where hosting is going. I mean, we're we're two people that work with hosting, you know, you're with Cloudways. I'm trying to build my own thing. I think it's a really interesting discussion because I think a lot of that's what a lot of people so there was also Sayed's uh tweet thread. Did you see that like uh a week ago? I did not. Oh, um, so he did this uh, this this tweet thread. We'll definitely link it in uh, in the description. But um, he discussed a bit, he was discussing a bunch of topics with WordPress. But one of them was basically managed product hosting. So like managed EDD, which they're doing with SiteGround. Nexus is basically doing managed LearnDash, like LearnDash Cloud. So just discussing this kind of idea of where hosting is going with more dedicated hosting platforms. So it's not just WordPress now it's, Oh, I want to use this specific product and I want to host it on a platform that's really optimized for this specific product. And how do we, how do we do that? And um, so I thought that's really fascinating because I feel that's kind of where and I'm curious to hear your opinion on that as well. Um, I feel like that's kind of where it's going for the next decade because I, I did a, a Reddit post uh, two weeks ago, I think, uh, discussing how basically hosting WordPress sites, you know, your news sites, your content sites is generally pretty solved at this point. There's a bunch of different architectures, but they're all they all have similar components. and They're just kind of like different flavors of vanilla ice cream. Basically, do you like, you know, this <laughs> vanilla flavor by, by, do you like Hagen does or do you want just a uh, standard vanilla flavor? But it's, they're just pretty much different ways of doing the same thing. So hosting WooCommerce is, is just starting. So only now that you see like GoDaddy, well, Nexus has been in it for a while now, for, for a few right. years, but GoDaddy, yeah, where Camp US just came out with, um, manage WooCommerce hosting and I think other uh, platforms. Uh, WP Engine has it already as well, I think. Yep. And then there are some that are more dedicated. Bluehost announced something um, during WordCamp US as well. Um, yeah. And that's, it's really interesting to see where that stuff is going. Uh, I'm really excited about the GoDaddy offering, but it's Pagely and Skyverge. So like, I believe Becca ran this team to build this new product. So Becca from Skyvert. I don't know who Becca is, and I don't even know really much about Skyverge. So like talk away. Yeah. So Skyverge, for those of you who don't know, uh, built most of the plugins that are on the WooCommerce marketplace. So 
Uh, they have been an integral part of the success of WooCommerce by making it do things that it didn't do by default. Uh, they wrote the uh, the structure for how payment gateway plugins are created uh, and created over 70 payment gateways themselves. <laughs> so uh, a lot of those are them. That's an insane amount of payment gateways. It, it really is. I'm, I might be wrong on that, but it feels like 70. Uh, so if I'm wrong, absolutely call me out. Um, you know, but it feels like a lot of payment gateways. Uh, and 70 is just the, the number I've always gravitated toward. But there are so many plugins that they've built. WooCommerce memberships is them. Uh, they built the Stripe plugin before it was handed over to the WooCommerce team. They built the Square plugin before it was handed over to the WooCommerce team. Um, and so GoDaddy acquired Skyverge uh, a little over a year and a half ago now, I think. So as in doing so, they acquired that entire library of plugins that are in the marketplace. So what this offering from GoDaddy has done is it's taken all of this knowledge that Skyverge has and it's coupled all of those plugins with a hosting platform that's built on top of Pagely's infrastructure. It's a really cool offering. Um, so you get all those plugins that normally you'd pay you know, hundred dollars a piece per year or fifty dollars a piece for some of them per year, and they're just bundled with your hosting. So really pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, I think that's kind of what a lot of players are looking at doing now. It's, they're that's why I think a lot of the hosting companies are buying all these plugins is they just they're trying to build their kind of wall garden hof- offering. How good it is for the larger community is up to debate, but as somebody that's building something to host these kind of WordPress applications as I like to call them because they're not really WordPress sites, they're more applications than than uh, content sites, it's really hard to optimize and increase performance and things like that when you can just install whatever plugin you want, especially with Woo. I'm sure you're well aware optimizing Woo and with a bunch of add-ons and things like that is really, really complicated. It can be, especially if some of those uh, plugins or extensions are written well and some of them are written really badly, Right. And I'm not saying they're badly written in general. I'm saying that they're not written for scale. Right. Yeah, exactly. I have to be really clear about the delineation there because I'm not trying to be rude to people who've built good plugins that just don't scale. Um, It's just that it's really hard to test for scale. And especially toward the beginning of the ecosystem's uh, creation, it was even harder because nobody knew what scale was going to look like in WooCommerce, right? And e-commerce scaling is just hard, period. Um, it is. Like coming yes. from like Magento and stuff like that. Like mm-hmm. it's just, it's, it's always hard. So it's not also like WooCommerce's fault necessarily. I mean, they have some tech debt that they really need to be working through. Like using the post, post meta, like now they have dedicated tables for that. For example, that's a good example of, of tech debt that they're slowly going through, but that applies to plugin as well. You, some plugins just don't scale well because they just weren't designed that way initially, but now they're going to be starting to be used on stores that are going to have like a lot of traffic and a lot of sales volume. And then all of this, these things break. Yeah. Well, and I think that's the same for, any of these larger ecosystem plugins, as Jonathan Wold likes to call them, right? Anything that introduces a suite of functionality for an audience, anything that provides an integration layer for additional extensions, and that creates and shapes its own ecosystem over time. That's an ecosystem plugin. That's how he defines it. And I think that what we're seeing is that hosting companies are seeing an opportunity with these ecosystem plugins to own a part of the ecosystem, right? So Automatic acquired WooCommerce to own WooCommerce's ecosystem. That's the long and short of it. You know, there's there's a benefit to having an ecosystem like that. 
Uh, WP Engine wanted advanced custom fields because it's an ecosystem, right? It's something that other people have extended that is integral to the way that some agencies do their work. And all of these ecosystem plugins, um, they have a you know, they have a marketplace around them. They they have other companies adding into what they can do. Gravity Forms is an ecosystem plugin because yeah. other people create plugins for Gravity Forms, right? You know, Gravity View wouldn't exist without Gravity Forms. Yeah, some businesses with multiple employees, sometimes like dozens, just build Gravity Form yeah. products. That's insane. It, it really is. But these ecosystem plugins are really the, they're the big hosting problem as well, right? And I say problem, but really it's just challenge, right? They're a challenge to host well. Uh, the bigger the ecosystem, the harder the challenge is. And one of the interesting things about having this open web ecosystem that we live in, in WordPress is hosting providers, right? Hosting providers, they're a part of this ecosystem. They benefit from the ecosystem, but they're really free riders. And you know, this whole free rider problem in open source uh, is, is an interesting thing. Uh, WordPress is free to use, right? The four freedoms guarantee no restrictions on its usage. It's maintained by volunteers. And the confidence of free riders in WordPress has led to investment. So that's why we have ecosystem plugins. Hosting companies should be investing in ecosystem plugins and extending their distribution. I fully agree with what Jonathan had to say uh, in his article on hosts and the free rider problem uh, regarding that. And the other thing he says is that product creators should be working hard to build partnerships with as many hosts as possible and not be exclusive. And I wholeheartedly agree with that too. So WooCommerce has done a really good job of this, right? There's no single host that, is the de facto standard recommendation for WooCommerce hosting. There are some that are better than others. At least not yet. Right, not yet. You know, da, da, da. <laughs> I mean, it could happen in the future where uh, there's somebody who pulls far ahead of everybody else. But the great thing about uh, a marketplace like this is that if somebody pulls ahead, that helps everyone, right? Because everyone else gets to see and learn from what that person did or what that team did. And so uh, that's kind of a very interesting piece of this whole, uh, this whole puzzle. So, you know, we're seeing some really interesting things happen uh, at WordCamp US. They announced, you know, WP.cloud. Apparently it had been existing for like over a year. I've been talking to people. I, did, I only learned about it like a week, a week and a half before WordCamp US. But like if you look back, I think on like uh, the, the Wayback Machine or whatnot, I think it's from 2021, like it came out, like the site's been up. Yeah, it's been around and, you know, it looks like Jesse Friedman is involved. She's with Pressable, right? Uh, I believe so. Yes. So, yeah, because Pressable runs on that. So that's what they, they that's what they're, they told me. Yeah. So and the interesting thing is the WP Cloud feels a lot like uh, what VIP Go was. Right. Now we have WP Cloud instead of VIP Go. I mean, it's very close to what Emir is because Emir is basically an API product. So it's, yeah. it's, 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 so it's very, they're very similar. I was just, I was like, oh, okay. Like I'm not the only one basically doing API driven infrastructure anymore. And no, it's kind of a validation of the work you've been doing with Emir, right? Yeah. I mean, I have kind of an interesting take on some of this because I think you're right. Like for some aspects, I think it's going to go that way, but I'm, also thinking, I think a lot of those plugins are going to become their own, like standalone products, you know, like, oh, yeah. like gravity forms, like, because, you know, like you have like type form, right? Like, 
technically, if if Gravity Forms wanted to just self host on a platform, that's where I think I come in actually. But um, but if Gravity Forms wanted to just host Gravity Forms, not WordPress, not nothing, just host forms based on WordPress, and you can just create forms and try to compete with Typeform, they could do that. Like if they could manage an infrastructure to just run their product on. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So there's a lot, I think there's a lot of that as well that's happening too. So you have like this kind of dedicated hosting setups. So manage WooCommerce, um, maybe something for Lyft LMS or because I think LearnDash Cloud is more like what I'm thinking about with like Gravity Forms. I think it's just like a standalone. I would agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's like just standalone, but that's what I mean. But that's a good example of like the, the dichotomy of like the two things that are going to happen, I think, is you're going to have dedicated like hosting services for for specific products. But you're also going to have like basically the standalone WordPress plugin pro- as a product in itself, like Learn Dash Cloud is. And I think that's also a thing that's going to probably happen because some of these products could compete theoretically with those SaaS products. The the problem that they have right now is that how do I host that? So Learn Dash was easy because they got bought by Nexus, right? It's their own by it's a Stellar WP brand. So uh so they're under Nexus. So Nexus was just like, okay, we'll just build the infrastructure for that. But if you're like on your own, how do you build that um infrastructure? So that's where I, I feel like that's where I'm like interested in that space, obviously, because I think there's a lot there as well for these like larger platform ecosystem plugins. I agree. I think that, you know, what we're going to start seeing is, well, what we're already seeing in the WooCommerce space, which is people building these customized hosting products just around WooCommerce. Um, you know, you said I'm working with Cloudways, obviously. Uh, there's a WooCommerce stack at Cloudways that you can you can deploy. Um, we have, you know, players that are focusing on just WooCommerce hosting, like Convesio. Nexus has been around for a while. You know, there's just a whole bunch of players in this space that are trying to make WooCommerce better and make it easier for store owners. And that's really the key, right? Because we can't have an army of people running agencies that are making tons and tons of money off of customizing WooCommerce to make it scale. It's just not, it's not something that can be sustained long-term customizing WooCommerce to build stores. Absolutely. That's something that long-term can be sustained, but working just in this performance and optimization space It's something that at some point the community or the ecosystem itself needs to take care of, right? Yeah, I mean, it's hard. I mean, my friend Patrick, who is doing Wugo Store, is basically on top of Emir, is is basically doing something like that, where he's like trying to basically build Shopify. Because there's nobody really that's trying to do it right yet, like something like Shopify, but with WooCommerce. So, like, you basically sign up and you get like a store, like, just the store, right? Like not the entire like WooCommerce install or whatnot. Like it's just like, you don't even necessarily know that it's WooCommerce. It's just like, you just set up a store and then it's WooCommerce behind the scenes. Right. Like, how do you get to that? How do you get to scaling that? Cause right now, like that's one a thing I was saying, like nobody could host Kim Kardashian's like clothing line with WooCommerce. Like it would just instantly, like they, she'd send a, a, uh, Instagram out for a sale and it would just like literally blow up. Well, to be fair, at one point, uh, Kylie's cosmetics line was on WooCommerce and it was running well. Uh, you know, it wasn't perfect, but it was running well and making tons and tons of money. Um, but it did eventually move to Shopify. And why did it move to Shopify? Well, back then, you know, this was. 2017, I believe, 2016, uh, it moved to Shopify because that they were sold 
on the fact that Shopify would always have the performance there and they wouldn't have to worry about it anymore, right? Yeah, exactly. And it, they probably sell even more now than they did back then, right? Like, so, like, think of, like, the problems they were having then versus, like, now, right? Like, the yeah. so it's just, that's a, that's kind of what I mean. Uh, like, it, it'd be very hard right now to, like, sell, like, a really, really high volume, like, burst volume um, WooCommerce site. Like, just it, keeping it up would be, like, really hard borderline i'm not sure impossible you know it's not impossible uh one of the things that we did uh when when my former agency and i were working on native deodorant um we would work on elastic beanstalk have auto scaling in place but we'd also pre-scale so we, we let them pre-scale the number of servers that they had for horizontal scaling of their web heads before they sent out a marketing email. And that generally was enough to keep the site up uh, with a 2 million person email marketing list. So, and they did really well on Woo. Um, in fact, Moyes, the founder of Native at uh, e-commerce fuel live in early 2020, I believe it was January of 2020. Um, he said that he wished he had never left WooCommerce. Who is it with now? Shopify? So they're, they're with Shopify because they were acquired by Procter and Gamble for a, a large amount of money. Uh, and all of Procter and Gamble's properties are on Shopify. So they moved to Shopify. Um, but they lost some of the functionality that they had on WooCommerce that was specialized and built for them. Like the, uh, the ability when somebody went to cancel a subscription to put the questionnaire in front of them, asking them why they were, why they were canceling and move them into a lower tier product rather than having them cancel completely. Right. It was all custom built for them on top of WooCommerce subscriptions and couldn't be done at the time on Shopify because none of the subscription platforms had that. So their rate of attrition went up. Yeah, I mean, th- those are good examples. Um, and that'll be the problem also if somebody builds like a WooCommerce platform, right? You'll be locked into whatever plugin suite that they want, right? If you like, if you have like a, if you have, You'll be like, okay, well, we optimize for those. We're not going to let you install whatever you want because we don't know like how it's going to behave. Because, like you said, like to loop back to what you said at the beginning, it's not necessarily the plugin developer's fault, but there's just like these scaling issues that you like can't really grasp until like you've seen it. I mean, let's be fair. Even WooCommerce didn't know that WooCommerce was going to scale to the levels that it has, right? So when this whole thing started, nobody expected that WooCommerce was going to be powering stores that were doing hundreds of millions or billions of dollars in sales per year. It just wasn't something we thought was going to happen. And then it did. And then it broke. And then we had to figure out how to make it work. That's been the challenge is building for scale is much harder than building just for functionality, right? Boy, do I know that. So <laughs> Yes, you do. Yes, you do. <laughs> That's all I deal with. And so it, it presents unique challenges, right? Like how, how do we handle things like fragment caching? How do we handle things like um, optimizing our queries to make sure that they are running as quickly as possible? How do we create adequate indexes so that lookups happen faster how do we um, how do we make sure that our code is running in the most efficient way possible how do we get away from the you know the fact that at scale a structure of you know value and and value meta right post and post meta or item and item meta doesn't doesn't work at scale it just doesn't work when everything is a custom post type it just blows up i mean magento has the same problem it's a known pattern it's called eav it's entity attribute value it's it's, and basically that's what like post meta is 
there's a trade-off basically. You get flexibility in how you can basically assign metadata to to things, right? You can assign anything t- to a post. You can create whatever post meta and assign whatever information you need to. The problem then becomes like, okay, well, that basically makes the database incredibly hard to uh, query because now you have to basically do a whole bunch of joins. Sorry, I'm being a nerd right now, but like Zach is nodding vigorously. But uh, yep. but basically after that, you're stuck doing like a bunch of joins on the same table to get the information you need on the same entity. And that's where like the whole thing breaks down because when it's all on the same table, it's a lot easier. You just look up the post and then you get all the information you need. The problem is like, it's hard to adapt that table because you want it to be flexible with the data that it has. So it's like, it's managing that trade-off that's really challenging, which is not really WooCommerce's fault per se, but it's... No, not at all. It's an it's a common uh, e-commerce problem because you just have a lot of... Like e-commerce suffers from the problem of like, you need a lot of custom data. Like if you sell shoes, you need to keep shoe sizes, manufacturers, that's not just SKUs. If you sell coats, it's something else. If you sell cosmetics, it's something else. So you need something, a data structure that can work, that you can work with to represent this this information. And that's even more complex if you're like, like a hardware store. Now you have to deal with like all sorts of different things that have all sorts of different metadata. And you have to be able to query that and get that information out. It's just very complex. Imagine a grocery store with... Uh, 100,000 plus products, right? I've never dealt with that. Never, not, not, not even once. Yeah, no, that'd be crazy as well. Like, it's just like large, large department stores, you know, like Rip Sears, but, you know, like Target, um, things like that, where you, you carry also, like you carry, like you said, it's like the worst of all the worlds. You carry food, you carry hardware, you carry electronics, you carry everything. And then add the complexity of market-based pricing and market-based tax rates, right? And then you add in the complexity of things like local pickup and delivery and shipping. Shipping rates is fun. If we had my friend Patrick, that's what he used to work on before he started the the Wugo stores. He, he did Canadian. It's an interesting thing. Oh my God. Yeah. He, he was like ripping his hair out and we're in Canada. We have I've, I, I'm gonna. I don't even. I'm bad. I don't even know how many provinces we have, but we have a lot less than 50 states. I'll de- I'll tell you that much. So, the, so like shipping rates between states, you know, from state A to state B is maybe not the same from state C to state B. Uh, so it's just, it's it's a hot mess. Well, and taxes in in the United States uh, are interesting mm-hmm. because there are some areas where. Um, I believe it's in Louisiana that each parish can have a different tax rate. Oh, I didn't know that, but I love Louisiana because they have parishes and it's very French. So I like, I love it. And there are hundreds of parishes that you potentially need a different tax rate for. And that's why companies like uh, Tax Jar and Avalara exist because these are complex problems, right? And so e-commerce in and of itself, WooCommerce, especially in, in the context of what we're talking about, you know, these, these products handle very complex data, very complex information, and they have to handle it for every possible scenario. And so we see, you know, the WooCommerce team moving toward custom order tables, which we've talked about before. We see the need for flattening some of these data types away from the posts table in order to improve overall performance. And some of these things are just now beginning to be tackled by the WooCommerce core team. And hosts have been pushing for this for a long time. When we were first working with uh, Liquid Web, when I founded my previous agency, we were working on the custom post or the custom order table uh, plugin. That was the first project we did with them was working on custom order tables and then working on some crazy big uh, elastic uh, stuff that we were trying to make work. Um, 
And so that was, you know, those were our first projects with them, trying to make WooCommerce faster by implementing new things. And we were running into the problem that they outline in this, uh, this new post they, they released uh, today about high, available, high availability WordPress uh, hosting and talking about uh, high performance order storage. And so one of the things they talk about, and I know we want to keep some of this stuff for another, um, another one of these uh, podcast episodes, but one of the things that they're talking about is that there's this overhead that they're going to keep synchronization so that every transaction is synchronized between both the current post and post meta model of storage and the new cut, the new data store which is the WC orders table uh, and the related tables for order addresses, operational data, and order meta. The reason why they say that this whole synchronization thing has to happen is because there are a number of plugins that still aren't using the CRUD layer that was introduced in WooCommerce 3.0 in 2017. Five years ago. (laughs) Right. So the CRUD layer uh, was released in WooCommerce 2.7. The first post about it was October 27th of 2016. Uh, For those of you who don't know, CRUD stands for Create, Read, Update, and Delete, or Create, Retrieve, Update, and Delete, depending on who you talk to. They implemented these CRUD classes that they're abstracts that abstract away how WooCommerce interacts with data stores for products, customers, orders, order items, and coupons. So since 2016, we've been capable. And since release in 2017, we've had the code available to implement custom data stores for all five of those item in those data types in WooCommerce. The problem has been that numerous plugin developers still find it easier to interact directly with the post meta table than to use the the CRUD classes that were created to avoid the problem that's being caused by interacting directly with the post meta table. If you're interacting directly with post meta and data moves out of post meta, your plugin will break. If you use the CRUD classes and data moves out of the post meta table, your plugin will continue to work. It's the whole reason they're there. And if you're not using the CRUD operations, the REST API uses them already. The admin in WooCommerce uses them. There's a whole bunch of features that use these CRUD classes. If your plugin is not using them, You are breaking the capability for WooCommerce to move forward into custom tables. I'm just going to be blunt about it. There you go. (laughs) You've been shamed. You've been shamed. (laughs) You are stopping our forward progress as a platform. So if you're a plugin developer, you're building WooCommerce plugins, make sure you're using the CRUD classes. If you need help, reach out. Happy to talk to you about how they work and what they do and where the documentation for them are. But they've been around for a while now and we should be using them. So I'm going to get off my soapbox now. (laughs) That's funny. Hey, everyone. Bob WP dropping into the show for a short break to tell you more about our two pod friends and to thank them for their amazing support. WPY Security, the brand behind WP Activity Log, also has you covered with CAPTCHA 4WP plugin. This slick integration with the Google reCAPTCHA gives your clients an easy way to add CAPTCHA checks to their shops on the Woo checkout, registration, and account pages. And as a bonus, you can select where you want to add that CAPTCHA on the checkout page. So I suggest you head over to WPWhitesecurity.com and help your clients protect their Woo shops from fake registrations and orders the right way. If you build WooCommerce sites, whether you're a freelancer, small business, or agency, 
Often optimization and maintenance is not something in your game plan. When you hand off the site to your clients, the last thing you want to happen is a disruption with their business and their sales. But MindSize has you covered. Now what's cool about MindSize is that their team of experts will take care of anything from a small site to a complex WooCommerce store, giving your clients peace of mind when their customers place an order on their site is such an important piece of the relationship. So keep your clients happy and send them to MindSize for that exceptional service they deserve. You can find them at MindSize.com. Make sure and check out both of these pod friends. And now let's get back to the show. I mean, there's a there's a reason why the hosts are locking it down, right? Because it's just like, you, you got it. It's hard. Like if, if it's not clear at this point in our conversation, uh, like e-commerce is hard. So I don't, uh, what do I want to say? Um, I'm having a brain fart here, but I don't envy. Yes, that's it. I don't envy anybody building an e-commerce platform because it's very hard. But at the same time, like if you want to be able to scale it, if you want to be able to, you, you need some form of control so you can manage those variables because there's so many of them. So that's kind of why you see these platforms having, you know, like um, with GoDaddy, they're built in on top of Skyverge stuff because it's just like, okay, well, we kind of, they're a known quantity. We can just build around that and it's, we know that will scale and we have control over it. So that's another thing too when i'm thinking about these kind of like hosted platforms like if if you had like hosted gravity view right like uh, not gravity view gravity form so if you just use gravity forms on a on a SaaS platform gravity forms can do the work of optimizing their code themselves better than they have the priorities in place more than somebody else would have so there's an incentive structure too there where it's a bit harder for WooCommerce hosting, like I know from t- having talked with Tom Finelli, just WooCommerce would definitely, it would behoove WooCommerce to hire a DBA, <laughs> like just flat out. Like it would just, it would behoove them to have like a, a database administrator. That, that's what DBA stands for. Like just somebody that's like an expert about databases and queries and things like that and can be like, okay, you can do this better. We can, like we have to rethink this and things like that because that is an important job of WooCommerce uh, scaling and just WooCommerce performance in general. Like something that like we started this this whole blog, uh, the, not blog, this entire podcast started because we just did one podcast on on performance. But like database performance is very important uh, for an e-commerce platform. So having somebody internally that's more focused on that and making sure that that progresses as well is, would be important, but it's hard when you're on the outside, you're like trying to make it work from the outside and you have no, you you don't have control as much on the priorities. If you're a product, if you're like Syed with EDD or you're, you know, like you're uh, Carl with, with gravity forms, um, you can set those priorities. So there's an advantage to that as well. When, when you own the, the kind of platform that people are building on, you can set those priorities when you're trying to host them and scale them. Yeah. We're, we're talking a lot about what should be done. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about what has been done. That's kind of unique in the WooCommerce space. So one of the conversations that I've been having a lot lately is about, a marketplace for WooCommerce or WordPress plugins in general, right? We have a marketplace for WooCommerce extensions, but we have no marketplace for for WordPress plugins. We have the free repository, the plugin repository, but nothing that allows selling WooCommerce or I'm sorry, nothing that allows selling WordPress plugins. And so all of these ecosystem plugins are creating their own marketplaces, right? They're creating their own just place where people can buy 
things that extend their product. Or we have the issue with everything being an island. So you have you know, a plugin like Gravity Forms that can't resell everything, right? They can't resell everything that everybody makes that works with Gravity Forms. So there's no real way to get everything Gravity Forms can do with all third-party extensions to it in one place, right? WooCommerce has done a really good job of consolidating a marketplace for extensions for their product. And they have gotten really good about being more inclusive in that marketplace than they used to be. You know, it used to take a lot to get into that marketplace because they were trying to make sure that they had quality over quantity at the time. And it's come to a point now where, well, there's definitely a need for more quantity than just quality. Um, and I'm not saying the new things being added aren't quality. I'm just saying that quantity has become the the goal now. Let more people in, right? And they've done a great job of that. Yeah, I mean, I agree. Um, that's also, I mean, it's all very comp. It's gonna. The good thing is when you have like a big platform like WordPress is that you can like, you know, there's there's different ways to approach the problem and. They're all they all come with pros and cons, and it's really up to the customer to decide really what is the best approach. You know? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And I think uh, you know that there are quite a few ecosystems that would do well to have more of a marketplace around them. Yeah, I I think you will see more of it because I think. At least that's kind of where I I wanted kind of this show a bit to go towards is, is this idea that the first decade of WordPress was a lot about hosting just content sites. But I think what's coming up next is a lot of these products and and applications. It's like, how do we host those? How do we package those? How do we sell them Um in a in a good way um because what i what i'm finding is that i think in general for hosting it's generally solved like like i said it's generally solved like most people that are worried about hosting they're not worried about their site going down generally anymore they're just like is the support good um you know is is the price good like do i get a good price to quality ratio um and if you're like getting a lot of traffic, sure, like you're worried about whether you're going to get enough traffic. But otherwise, um, you're there's nothing too much to differentiate yourself on anymore. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it looks like Till just joined us, which is uh, I don't think we've ever had anybody join mid episode before. So we'll have to see how this works. No, this is the first. Yeah, I like to be a pony. I mean, we know that already. Uh, so we we've talked for the last 40 minutes. So that means you need to talk for the last 20. <laughs> yeah, we're done now. Uh, it's all on till now. Uh, you have no context of what we've been talking about, but go. <laughs> 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 Just the exhale there was perfect. So we've been talking about uh, the evolution of hosting and how, Hosting is starting to be more product focused rather than just WordPress focused. So the the advent of you know, WooCommerce specific hosting and the possibility of other product led hosting in the future for things like EDD or Gravity Forms or any of these other larger ecosystem plugins. Yeah, Learn Dash Cloud. Yeah. I, I hear a lot of this and there's a lot of things in the works. It's working with all these hosting companies for Object Cash Pro. I hear a lot of product focused hosting products <laughs> um, are being in the works with, with a lot of people and not only the hosting companies, also actual product owners or product creators, com companies who make products who then want to go into the hosting market and are looking for how can we host this and actually focus on you know, if you can't, obviously can't talk about any names, but if you have something really difficult, like any kind of community or LMS focused sites, 
sometimes the hosting requirements are so niche or so specialized that they actually want to create their own hosting offerings. Plus, they already have the customer base that they are selling to or marketing to. Um, it's quite, I think the market is going to shift quite a bit in the future. Yeah, or sassify your offering, basically. But that was the example with Gravity Forms. Let's say Gravity Forms wanted to compete with Typeform, for example. Because mm-hmm. I'm seeing, like, with Emir, I, that, I mean, I think that's, that w- that's what keeps me going, is basically I think Emir is really well positioned for that because the some of my customers, that's literally what they're building. They're building products yeah. on top of WordPress, but you don't really see that it's WordPress. It's like, it's really like WordPress, the application and um, the backend. I have like, well, like they're like it, one's in beta right now. So I'm, I'm looking forward to when it launches and I can talk about it. Um, but, but this idea, right? Like you, you kind of have WordPress and maybe it's just even WordPress is just like as an API. So uh, could just be like a GraphQL or just a REST API. And then you have like something headless basically built on top of that. So you have like Next.js, like Vercel hosting the front end and it's it's still a product. It's still WordPress. So we're getting closer to Matt, like Matt saying like WordPress was supposed to be like WordPress OS, you know, operating system. So we're getting closer to that. <laughs> I don't know about that. That's a, that's a long gap between an OS and where WordPress is right now. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I was just it's a platform. It's an application framework, if you want. Like, it's not really as as two of us that use Laravel pretty extensively. I think you know, I'd rather use Laravel than build on top of WordPress. But you know, um, but it's possible, and like that's a lot of what I did early on, like even a decade ago. Like, um, was build kind of these use WordPress to build very complex. That's what basically those large plugins are. Like a learn dash is like it's more of an application than than work than a CMS. You know, like it's you know some of these plugins are basically full blown applications. They just run in WordPress. Buddy Bus is another good one. It's massive. Yeah, yeah, that it is. Uh, and Optin Monster was kind of an interesting story when when they rebuilt Optin Monster. Um, the team at Awesome Motive built it on top of WordPress, right? So not a plugin for WordPress. They built the actual SaaS on WordPress. And I don't know if it's still yeah. running. That's what Sayed was talking about in the in the Treadwheel link. Yeah, I was gonna say I don't know if it's still running that way, but they still use Object Cash Pro and OptimMonster.com for the API. So I assume so. Yeah, as far as I know, it's still it's still basically WordPress that's running that product. Yeah, it's just a gigantic I mean that's that's crazy to me. It's awesome, but it's crazy to me that that's you know been built on top of WordPress, right? I mean, I might the craziest thing, and I'm sure Till agrees, is just they went and they decided, you know what? We're gonna rebuild it, we're gonna use WordPress. I was just like I'd be like, oh my goodness. Like <laughs> Yeah. Who was in the room present? Yeah, I'd like to. I'd like to hear the details. Yeah, I'd I'd love to be on a fly on the wall where they debated that. I was just like, yeah, yeah. How much? How much trouble could it be? Yeah, it's uh, it's very interesting to uh, to think about building a large SaaS product on top of WordPress, right? Yeah, but that's what's coming. Yeah. Because like I said, like all the content stuff is generally like well solved and then they're competing with Wix and Squarespace, but really like it's the full site editor. But in terms like, especially for hosting and stuff like that, they're like focused on what's what's next. Like how do we expand our markets? Like what are the ways? Like some of them are like looking to host, you know, if you're Pantheon, for example, you hosted Drupal, you got into WordPress. Some people like Kinsta, Kinsta is a good example. Kinsta is like branching out into like hosting like, like databases and just web servers and not necessarily like just WordPress. They're, they're going more on the, the cloud, like the cloud route, like more of a digital ocean route mm-hmm. versus dedicated products around WordPress. But it's, that's where everybody's going. They're like, okay, how can we diversify our market? Yeah. And I also noticed that a lot of hosting companies are starting to do partnerships instead of everything gets bought up, which still is happening, but there's more, 
patch stack i think all of us a really good example who doesn't want to sell doesn't have to sell it's got a sweet product and all the hosting companies are slowly partnering up with them because it provides a really valuable service on top of their wordpress specific hosting product plus like wordpress plus here's the three four essential you always want your performance your security and i assume there's three other categories that i don't care about but they are probably important for most people that are included i don't know maybe it's like the page builders or the yeah I, I don't know what the other categories are but i often find that you always want to cover at least security and and performance yeah, for sure and i yeah i like the yeah no i agree. partnership model growing without everybody being bought out i really like seeing this i mean that's what i'm trying to do but we'll see but it's different type of partnership with what well just with plugins like people like because i don't want to do hosting i just want to like partner with people that want to offer like um scalable the the serverless stuff ah uh, so email as a platform that people can leverage yeah but i mean wp cloud is is really the closest thing right now to which is extremely locked down there's no you have zero freedom of what's running you you just get a f- a static box and you can do user and php stuff but that's it which is you know if you want to build large-scale applications or anything custom sometimes you need a specific php extension to i don't know do international date con- uh, whatever it is I, I can't come up with an example here no that's a good one like uh, there's a there's definitely stuff like i mean for me it's like if you want to install like uh, there's a good like a good one would be I mean for breath for example you're using breath like it doesn't come with Imagic like so if you wanted like like an image manipulation plugin uh, extension there there's a bunch of things that having it locked down like that is a detriment for sure yeah I think it's gonna bite them in the ass you know it's uh it's kind of a a double edged sword, right? Because you want to limit what people can do in order to reduce the support burden in order to offer a lower cost product. Uh, but at the same time, the more you restrict, the more people complain and don't like your product, right? So, Cloudways, for example, you don't get root access, right? You have an application and uh, a master user. You, you don't get root. Why? Because it would increase the support burden if you could just do whatever you want, right? So in order to keep costs low for support and focus support on only the things that they should have to worry about, things are a bit locked down. I think that's kind of a good balance, Uh, but it depends on your use case. Yeah, I'm struggling to see how I'm going to balance that myself. I think it's just going to be like higher... I mean, the way I want it is just having partnerships with agencies or, or whatnot that can just like do the more bespoke things that you want um, or like the optimization. Because, yeah, like right now, like I have one customer, I'm just like basically like auditing their code. I mean, that's why like large platforms like Altus or VIP do code audits too, like before, right? You got to. It's just, it's very complex because there's so many moving parts and people can install whatever they want. So it's just really hard to like, you you just have to make trade-offs around how you want to support that. Well, and that's a big part of the, the cost involved with VIP or with Altus as well. It's just that code review process. It's not cheap, right? Um, so that's why those products cost what they do because... That entire review process takes time, effort, engineers, and it it's all to make sure that you're better in the long run for it, but it does increase the cost, right? So when you're looking to do things that are extremely complex and custom, uh, expect your cost of hosting to go up proportionally to how custom it is. That's just that's where I'm at uh, or how I feel things should be. Uh, your cost should be reflected based on how much effort it takes to keep things running. Yeah. The trade-off between sub- quality of support and flexibility on your server. I can see that makes sense. Exactly. Which was also 
Yeah, Carl and I had many, many long text conversations about this because there's a finished made product called Laravel Vapor that can host, could host my API. But it was, and, and, and it would do everything I wanted. There was, I don't think there was any really big downside. There were some weird technical decisions, but I could probably look over them. However, they had full access to my AWS account or the AWS account. And to me, that is like, I don't want to expose all my customer data to the support team. And of course, you know, what are the chances that someone would log in? And it's a lot of hurdles that they have to jump through, create new accounts. But that's also a thing I'm worried about because basically Emir is Laravel Vapor for, but, you know, if I get to the point where like, I mean, some people worry about that, but. And some don't, yeah. I think there's ways around there's a like there's different technologies you can like like GitHub had the same problem right like could you could sell like on prem right um they sell host the the thing or I mean so I call those future call problems like I have like 20 something customers it's they're not like if you're worried about me giving access at least I take a lot of precautions like I can't I'm sure they do too on the Laravel side but like like credentials are encrypted at rest, you know, um, and it's a different AP, it's a different encryption key than the the application key and things like that, you know. Like I, because um, I take that stuff quite seriously. So it's, but yes, it's realistically you could create it without like and just like choose like very specific like permissions. It's just easier to just do the full access. But eventually I could just audit what you actually need and then just be like, okay, you need to add like these 20 roles and you'll be good. So we are coming up on an hour here. Uh, So I think we should start to wrap up and, uh, and kind of save some of this topic for later. Um, I'm sure there's more we can talk about here. Maybe in the future we can have a guest on that is running one of these more specialized WooCommerce hosting platforms uh, and talk with them about what they're doing and what makes them unique. What keeps them up at night? That's what I'm interested in. Yeah. Yeah. What keeps them up at night is always an interesting topic, too. Um, Till, I'm glad we were able to uh, have you join here. Gentlemen, it was a pleasure seeing you. Um, I'm glad we connected pretty quickly. Yeah. Likewise. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad we're able to do this every month. Bob, thank you as always for giving us this, uh, platform in which to, uh, be ourselves. Yeah. Thanks, Bob. But thank you, uh, everybody who listens for listening to us talk about all of these technical thoughts that we have. Uh, if you're getting value out of this, please let us know. Uh, if you want to hear about certain subjects or topics in the WooCommerce space and development, uh, please let us know as well. Uh, and Bob will link to how to get in touch with us about those things in the show notes. So thank you both for being here, Carl, Till. It's been great. And uh, we'll see you next time. Have a good day. Yeah, see you next time. Hey everyone, Bob WP here, and thanks again for tuning in to today's show. I'd like to give one more shout out to our two pod friends. CAPTCHA 4 WP plugin is great for easily integrating Google CAPTCHA for added security on your clients' WooCommerce shops. You can find that at WPWhitesecurity.com. When it comes to optimization and maintenance services, put your clients in the capable hands of MindSize at MindSize.com. Don't miss Woo Session next week. A lot of great sessions coming your way as well as end of the day wrap ups from Do the Woo. Just head over to WooSesh.com and register for free. So until the next time, keep on doing the Woo.